So this show that's on at the Metropolitan Museum right now uh, is actually, I think it's been 25 years since there's been a large survey of uh, Winslow Homer's work in New York. Um, and Winslow Homer was a very private fellow. He, he um, did not do a lot of interviews. He didn't write a lot of letters or talk about his work a, a lot, though much has been written and much has been speculated about him. Um, there, there have been a lot of studies and there are a lot of scholars on his work since it is very much um, a, a, an American original, let's put it that way. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the first page here. Renowned for his powerful paintings, um, uh, Homer uh, remains a consequential figure whose art continues to appeal to broad audiences. This exhibition reconsiders Homer's work through the lens of conflict, a theme that crosses his prolific career. A persistent fascination with struggle permeates his work from the emblematic images of the Civil War and Reconstruction that examine the effects of the conflict on the landscape soldiers and formerly enslaved people in dramatic scenes of rescue and hunting as well as monumental seascapes, dazzling tropical works painted throughout the Atlantic world. The centerpiece of the exhibit is uh, Homer's iconic Gulf Stream, a painting that reveals his lifelong engagement with charged subjects of race, geopolitics, and the environment, featuring 88 oils and watercolors, Cross Currents represents the largest critical overview of Homer's art and life in more than a quarter century. So on the bottom, you see a, a few pictures of him um, throughout his mature life. And, and the, the one over on the right actually uh, has Gulfstream on the easel while he's working on it. Okay. Um, Boston Common, which is, which is a, um, a, a piece that, that's actually a wood engraving done from a drawing that he did. So, Let's let me let me um, let me step into a little bit of um, his history, his early life, and all of that. Um, he was born in 1836, um, and basically, uh, they were a long line of New Englanders. Uh, his mother was a gifted amateur watercolorist and Homer's first teacher. Um, so basically he was encouraged to, to pursue it. Um, when he reached age 19, his father um, found him a, um, uh, a job with a lithography company. And at the time, lithography was really what was used to illustrate magazines and, and so, he really learned his craft by doing it, by being in there and working on, on actually carving the, the plates and, um, and, and learned how to create composition and, and all that through work. He, he really was um, uh, self-taught. Um, Let's see. Yeah, uh, yeah. He started. He started work uh, with a magazine up in up in Boston, and then and then actually later on in his career got um, uh, a job with uh, Harper's Weekly, and many of his illustrations came from that. So he he actually was 
an illustrator for more than 20 years, um, focused mainly on that. Um, he didn't start to paint until he was about 27, I believe it was. Um, so um, he was based in Boston for for the first part of his life, and then and then. Um, in 1859, moved to New York to the 10th Street Studios, which actually have come up before in these talks. It was a spot where a lot of artists had had, you know, uh, their studios in New York. Uh, William Merritt Chase and um, uh, a number of others. Ryder, I believe, had had a studio there. Um, so it was it was really. Um, a focal point. Um, when he opened his studio, it was really um, uh, designing, um, but he did attend classes at the National Academy and at, um, uh, where else was it? I think it was the New York, um, uh, there's another one in New York. Anyway, um, that this is where he stu studied painting to begin with. Um, when the war came, the Civil War, uh, he got an assignment from Harper's Weekly. And you see on the lower right, um, Thanksgiving in camp. And basically, he went to the front lines and and did these drawings, um, which were translated into the prints for Harper's Weekly. Um, the, the painting on the lower right was one of his one of his first paintings that he did on the front lines. And he did these from the drawings that he would do when he was out there. So he would he would do these very fast line drawings and then bring them back to the studio and work them up into paintings. Um, very powerful, you know, really wonderful technique. I mean, the guy was, the guy was really a gifted um, tonal painter. Um, okay. Um, home Sweet Home actually uh, I believe he got that piece into a show at the National Academy and it got it got really um, great reviews and all that. But you see how the theme of conflict is is, is being is being brought out in in these pieces. Um, he he did a lot of um, illustrations as as you see on the right this was from after the war so he would you see the drawing on the top and you can see in the the wood engraving how that was integrated into the piece um, so at that at this point he was no longer doing the actual wood engraving himself he would do these drawings and send them and they had a crew of uh, printmakers master carvers who would who would actually do the illustration. Um, okay. And this is, you know, the wilderness, um, skirmish in the wilderness. The wilderness was one of the, the, the last great horrendous battles of the of the Civil War. Um, and this is a painting that he did of that of that skirmish. There, these are these are all fairly fairly small. Um, the you know the skirmish piece would probably be twelve by sixteen or something like that. Um, on the top, um, the veteran in a new field. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about this one. Um, Yeah, um, many of his best works are very ambiguous in 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 what's going on with them. They they um, 
they have some kind of a narrative going on, but it's 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 kind of implied in the piece. Um, you know, the, this this you know the Grim Reaper. I mean, basically, if you look at this, if you look at the painting, you can see in in this section in here that that it, it actually was a different farm implement that was used for, for um, gleaning the wheat. Um, and he painted that out and replaced it with this single sickle that, that um, you know, it's the Grim Reaper. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact that, that He's using this harvesting tool that's kind of um, uh, sorts into plowshares. Um, it, it's um, in in the lower down here. You can barely see it. Let me see if I can get the um, the zoom up here for a second and come Wait, over. Um, yes. I just want to interrupt. Um, we're not. If you have a question, please type it in the chat function. We're not oh, yeah. using the rat raise your hand function. Just type it in the chat function. Thank you. Sorry, Larry. It's okay. That's great. Thank you, Joan. Um, in in this, it's it's hard to make out, but in in this lower right hand corner, there's actually a union jacket and and a hat and and um, and a canteen. Um, so, you know, th this is. There's there's the whole um, aspect of of him coming back to the world, and you know he's he's bringing in the harvest for our our nation. You know it's that whole that whole notion is is coming into play here. Um, you know basically back to feeding the nation rather than rather than you know reaping the harvest of death. Um, he's got his back to us, you know, you can, it's, it's kind of like he's, he's moving on. All right. And so is the nation. Oh, okay. Okay. And prisoners on the front is another one of, uh, of his, major paintings and and this actually this piece actually got into a um exposition in paris um it's a very interesting piece the body language of the officers mirroring each other you know with the raised knee you know these guys are beaten but not bowed um and you know, th these are these are issues which which weren't lost on Homer. He was really um, sharp with 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 what he was including in here. You know that 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 whole notion. Um, okay, Homer focused on the black plight in the post-slavery era. Um, and this is repeated a number of times. Um, he, um, depicts the, the, um, the African-American post-slavery plight with and and does it with dignity he actually he actually shows these these people from a very different point of view there isn't you know i don't know of a lot of um um post-civil war paintings by white painters that deal with this there there are a few black painters who dealt with it and and i'll i'll pull up some some images a little bit later there's a there's a dignity and solidity to this this lone black woman standing in the shadows 
the fact that it's named near Andersonville also is something that, you know, as many of you I'm sure know, Andersonville was the site of a horrendous prison camp that, that, uh, that Northern soldiers who were captives were kept. Um, so there's a number of different things at play in, 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 this, in this particular image. Okay. The post-war national yearning for a simpler, stable life, simpler, stable time. The Red Schoolhouse kind of was a symbol of, of small town, rural America, and, and the Red Schoolhouse was something that was vanishing. Um, things had changed. But the interesting part about this piece is, you know, he did he did this illustration for Harper's of the of the snap the whip, and then he um, actually developed this painting. Um, okay, croquet is beautifully painted. Um, the interesting part that, that I'm gonna I'm gonna draw our attention to in, in a number of these paintings is, is though though there's a group of people that are together, they're not interacting directly. They're playing a game together, but their gaze does not engage. They're not they're not looking at each other, they're really focused kind of. There, it's more of an inner focus. Um, and again, this is, this is leisure. It's um, 1866, it's the year after the war. Um, okay, these, these are a bit later. Um, this is actually uh, in 1867, um, Homer went to Paris uh, along with, along with the, um, the painting of the captives. Um, he spent a year in Paris, so he was very aware of what was going on there. Um, and this particular painting, um, again, it's waiting, this sense of, of, um, of loss of, 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 you know, so many men were, uh, devastated by, by the civil war. And the, the, the ongoing challenge of going out to sea to earn a living, basically, if, if this if this is a you know the son of a of a fisherman they're they're there waiting for him to return um but it it speaks to a deeper mourning a deeper grief a deeper sense of loss in in the society at the time you know this is this is less than 10 years after after the civil war okay the old mistress, ambivalent uh, greeting. Um, there aren't a lot of paintings actually that I know of that deal with this kind of issue. I, I, um, I have some things here, let's see, I wanted to read about this. Um, okay, so this mistress, you know, the scene takes place in a humble house, a group of African-American women, their former mistress presumably just entered. She stands rigidly in profile, turned toward her for former slaves. All the black women, including the toddler, stare directly at their visitor with unwelcoming <laughs> expressions. Uh, the standing women are at similar heights, placing them on an equal footing with each other. Um, one of the things that, that I, I read 
uh, is that originally um, he was holding a red carnation, um, the the mistress. And, and it was kind of a, uh, an, an offering. Um, and Homer painted it out and replaced it with this, with this uh, fan that, that's dangling at her, at her uh, feet. Um, one of the things I wanna, I wanna point out too is I'm gonna zoom in. If you look here, you can see the ring on her finger. And if you go over here to this one, you can see the shine of the ring on this mother's finger. And during the time of slavery, slaves were not allowed to marry. So this is a very and this is this is something which which Homer would have specifically put in there to emphasize this this change in relationship. Um, it doesn't look like they're any too prosperous. That that home looks pretty pretty dingy. Um, so this is a, a really ambiguous greeting. Um, you know, all the all the African American um, women are wearing earth tones. Um, the uh, the formal black gown that the mistress is wearing with lace on the outside. Um, basically, it's it just sets up a bold difference in in class and category. Um, So the this was this was in 1876. Um, and that was, you know, the year before actually um, a number of the reconciliation, the um, the actual uh, what have we got here? It was, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, it, it, the reconstruction period, actually, the civil rights, there were amendments that were, that were put into place that the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments were, were put into the, the Constitution. Almost immediately, they were, they were opposed. And... Um, uh, if you, you know, basically the Jim Crow um, uh, acts were put into full force by 1877. So this is kind of the year before. If you look at these two women who are harvesting cotton, um, they look they look pretty tired after a long day's work. But if you if you notice in let's see, in this section. Her, her dress is being snagged by the cotton. It's kind of like she's being held back from going forward into the future. Um, it's very interesting stuff. And, and Homer, having been an illustrator, you know, he, he was very particular about what he was including in these pieces. So the, those were not um, symbols that were, uh, kind of haphazardly thrown in there. And this is Henry Tanner, who, who studied at the Pennsylvania Academy. He was an African-American painter um, and, and actually moved to um, Paris in 1891 and found great success there, actually, great international acclaim. These pieces, um, the um, banjo lesson is kind of a, a, um, an answer to Jim Crow. It, it's kind of taking that minstrel uh, buffoonery 
and 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 in, imbuing it with dignity, passing on this this um, this ability to play music to the grandchild. Um, it's a very interesting piece, and and. Um, He's, he is a terrific painter. Uh, let's see. Okay. And, and again, um, uh, 1874, the, this Homer piece from uh, East Hampton, he, um, he got out there to East Hampton before Chase. Chase didn't get out, didn't go out there and paint a lot until the 1880s and didn't start his school until I believe the 1890s. So um, uh, uh, on the top is the French painter Eugene Boudin, who was one of the wonderful impressionists that that uh, Homer would have seen. I think I think Homer was was especially influenced by people like like Manet, but I I truly believe that he did see Boudin. And if you look, you know, very closely at these pieces, let's see if I'll zoom in a little bit, you see that the the faces have minimal indications of of uh, of features. Um, again, something else I'm going to point out is although they they sit together they don't seem to engage one another um, and i'm going to go up here to the boudin and again not much by way of facial features they're just painted in and they're there and beautifully painted but just an, an implication of the facial features not that they couldn't paint them, but there was there was a purpose to this. It was it was really about the atmosphere and about the the um, impression, <laughs> shall we say? Um, okay. Um, so. Th this is this is again uh, an assignment for um, Harper's, um, but the the theme of 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 being by the ocean of of that whole um, aspect, um, the elemental presence of the sea is something that he's going to come back to over and over again and expand as as his career goes on so i'm going to keep moving along here and you know he did these pot boilers that that um he he, he basically sold a lot of these watercolors the watercolors really had a good market so he would he would crank out a lot of them um I'm throwing these two in. I don't believe that these are in the show, but I'm throwing them in to give you some idea of, you know, he did do these, you know, sweet little kind of illustrative pieces. Um, it, it really, um, you know, they sell and and they they had homes, so on it went. He he did he went to um, England in in uh, eighteen eighty one into eighty two he was there for eighteen months and basically took to painting the washerwomen um, the um, the the working women and fishermen were were really his subject matter and he focused very much on them it it was very different from the subject matter of somebody like um john singer Sargent, who was who was focused on high society and these flattering portraits of 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 the aristocracy um and 
many, many critics had had trouble with the fact that he was doing these earthy subjects and that that it wasn't about this kind of um, um, high society. Um, it really um, it foreshadows the kind of social realism that came into vogue with Robert Henry and the Ashcan School. Um, and so I wanted to I wanted to really talk a little bit about that too. So he he spent time in Gloucester and and um, and did did these beautiful pieces. He summered there in 1880 and run, went back repeatedly over over the years. And these beautiful, loose, simple watercolors were things which, number one, sold very well, but he really gained his fluidity. Um, really, one of the things I want to say is, is um, Homer's watercolors, Homer and Sargent's watercolors, really changed the stature of 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 watercolor as far as being considered a fine art medium before that period it was really used more as a a way of coloring a drawing but these become um worked in a very different way and and i'll go into a little bit more detail as we go along here these gorgeous pieces from from Gloucester are just, you know, stunning, fast, small, but but really potent pieces, very expressive. And Edward Hopper, who's who's another one who um, uh, owes a debt to to Homer, but but also parallels his his career in a lot of ways. Um, uh, Hopper and Homer both started out as illustrators and earned a good deal of their their living by doing illustration until they until they began to make it. In fact, um, Homer didn't really reach the point of 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 success where he was not. Um, constantly hustling. He didn't get there until pretty late in his life. It was 1880s, the late 1880s, when he started to make a breakthrough. And in the 1890s, he was really quite successful and, and was able to um, uh, buy property and have rental um, uh, income coming in. So that he's his he was stabilized and was able to paint whatever he wanted to paint. Hopper, on the other hand, did did these did these illustrations and and maintained his his um, his life as a fine artist. But but he was until you know it it took a good twenty years doing illustration to get to that point for him also. Okay. Breezing up is um, is again one of um, Homer's critical um, successes. Basically, the theme this theme of the small boat in in rough seas is something that we're going to come back to, and 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 in in fact, uh, Gulf Stream is just that. Uh, The, the perils of the, of the sea are something that he that he really comes back to over and over again. Um, this was an observed scene. This uh, it, there was actually a rescue at sea off of Atlantic City, and he did a, a set of drawings from from that experience. Um, this kind of tenuous struggle. Um, against against the ocean 
the the other thing that I want to I want to say is there's obvious physical contact here between the rescuer and this this woman, but there's there's this red scarf blowing up like a barrier in front of his face. It's kind of like this barrier between them. Um, interesting. I don't know. You know, I'm just saying uh, that's another one of those those correlations to Edward Hopper and the isolation of his figures. Um, it's, it's an interesting piece of something to think about when you're looking at the work. Okay, so by um, 1883, uh, Homer had enough success so that he moved from New York City up to Prout's Neck, Maine, where he created a studio um, in, a, in a carriage house by the sea. And um, he actually did winter up there quite a bit and he, he loved the isolation, but some of the, some of the times during, during that period, he would go to the Caribbean during the winter um, and found this just fabulous, uh, array of radiant subject matter that just moved him. Um, so these delightful, luminous watercolors were pieces that came out of that. Um, they're big, bold shapes. Um, And it really shows a, ma a great mastery of the, of the technique. He would, he would use big abstract forms and then, and then choose his details um, so there's enough information so you know exactly where you are in space, but not so much that it clutters up and interferes with this radiant, beautiful color that he got out of these pieces. Okay, so again, we're back to the sea. And notice that the crews here are all black, that, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the white boat, the sails, the white clouds, but these dark figures on, 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 on the boats. And we're going to go back to this, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like the, the other side of, of the, of the, the Gloucester fishermen um, in, in, in the Caribbean scenes most of the crews are black and 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 most of the subjects that he paints in in these paintings are are black post slavery but you know the the echoes of colonialism are all there so let me let me move on a little bit here. Oh yeah. Oh, here's um, I saw this piece, this orange tree with gate, and um, and I remembered this uh, John Singer Sargent piece. So I brought that up just to show you that they they kind of you know had some had some parallel courses. Um, let's see. Beautiful, amazing pieces. Um, crisp, clean, you know, not cluttered, not overworked. Um, beautiful compositions. I, you know, I'm going to actually zoom in a little bit here so you can see some of the detail. You can see the line, you can see, you know, the where the graphite line is and how he repainted the figure. You know, he wasn't filling in those, those lines. He was really painting with them as kind of a matrix to play off of, but they, they you know, the brushwork 
has its own has its own independence of those lines in many ways. And oh well, what the heck? Uh, we might as well go take a look at these guys too. <laughs> Uh, I love these Bermuda settlers. <laughs> Again, you know, um, th this piece in many ways uh, reminds me of those of those big open Fairfield Porter paintings where there's these just these broad areas of 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 flat color, but they work as 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 um, as a design, but also as depth. His his use of of warms and cools, you know, this business of the 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 warm red wash that's underneath the shadow um, draws it into the foreground, where you know the 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 rest of the painting sort of recedes in this blue, in this combination of blues. Okay. So here again, we have, um, you know, his, his fascination with, with the forces of the sea. Um, he loved this business of, you know, the post hurricane wreckage and all that now you know finding this dead body on the shore i mean i don't know if that's really a dead body if he if he actually you know had somebody pose for him or something like that but um let's see i'm going to zoom in a little bit on this one too um so you can see how the painting has been worked there's there's areas of gouache he would he would wet and blot out things, pull, pulling up paint to, you know, like in, in, in here, you can see that he kind of blotted back that dark. Um, so there's, there's dashes of, of opaque watercolor in here too. Um, and and I think on the figure itself, there's some opaque watercolor, so it's got that kind of solidity. Okay. Ah, and then there's this one. This is this is the late masterpiece. Um, this fellow's in deep trouble. He's adrift on this turbulent sea. The um, you know naming it the Gulf Stream speaks about Homer's awareness of of. Um, the physical as well as metaphoric currents that that were taking place in in this this situation you know he's on this crippled boat in a very inhospitable sea beset by sharks um uh and and what's that stuff that's sticking out of the cabin there Okay, it's it's actually sugarcane. Okay, so we're talking about uh, let's see, I'm gonna zoom in so you can see it. So this is quite an ominous piece. Um, you know, you you also see, you know, this could be reflections of of sunlight it could also be blood in the water it could also be some other fish i don't know um but this guy's in pretty desperate straits there's a water spout coming at him um homer came back in and painted in this little sailboat after the painting had been finished and uh you know it's it's it may be a glimpse of hope on the horizon. Um, yes. Um, so again, here's the remnants of 
of the the um, uh, colonial period, these cannons on the shore. Um, and now we're going to pop back to New England and the and the fishermen. Um, Uh, so, um, here, here is, um, a fisherman, uh, in, in the Adirondacks, there's this warm reflection encircling the fisherman and the autumn foliage, but what he did was conserve that white, that, that is on the fisherman. It's the only spot that that is untainted, aside from the aside from the uh, casting pole. And I think he scratched that into the surface of the paint to get that white mark to come out. Uh, see. Okay. Ah, and this beauty. You know, he did he did a lot of these paintings of hunters and and fishermen in in uh, in the Adirondacks and in the northern woods. Um, it's another great theme of his of his of his career. Um, not focusing that much on that because it's it's really um, not in kind of keeping with what's going on with the. Um, the theme of the show itself so that they, they've got some of these included because they're just gorgeous paintings and they talk about being you know out there on the edge in in the blood in the blood hunt um but this piece which is one of it one of homer's um larger pieces it's it's 38 by 68 inches. These black crows uh, over, over this fox who's kind of stuck in the snow. Uh, and these, you know, these hungry crows, you know, we don't know if this fox is going to make it or not. Um, it, it's kind of a question um that has been asked if if uh homer was identifying with the fox or the crows i think uh he he lived such a solitary life and really went his own path so i think he really identified with that with that individuality that would be separate from the crowd um it's a really interesting painting though beautifully painted again um And this wonderful late painting kind of embodies the mystery and the power of the sea that Homer so loved. Um, it, it was worked on for a long time. And this would have been probably near where his studio is in Prout's Neck. Um, gorgeous painting, really wonderful, beautifully painted. So many the range of marking in in the sea and it's so abstracted, you know, this just these different textures and layers that he pull out. Um, okay, and driftwood was his last oil painting. That was this was the last piece that he did. Um, and, you know, you can see that there's uh, a, um, you know, this, uh, this character is not in peril, but there's, there's a sense of the, of the the mystery the unknown, the unknowability of the forces of, of the ocean. Um, and, you know, 
this was late in his life, so he you couldn't help but make some make some uh, have some thought about about um, his impending death. He died in uh, at seventy four, and um, really his family was his closest friends, the closest people that 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 he had throughout his life. He was close to his brother and and um, close to his mother. Um, so uh, a great painter and and took um, a international um, approach to painting to America and 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 focused on on you know a a view of of our country in in a very transitional period of time okay so thank you all for joining us um are there any questions that came up Nope. Okay. Um, let me just uh, change this. Uh, nope, Larry, nothing, nothing has come up, but this okay. was a real in-depth um, run of uh, Homer, Winslow yeah. Homer's life <laughs> and the way his paintings have evolved. Yeah. I loved it. And I'm there's sure a, many there's people a, get to There's do. a lot more. There's a lot more really? of the hunting paintings and things like that that I didn't I didn't pull out because they really weren't kind of in keeping with what was going on with this sh mm -hmm. this particular show. But um, you can tune into some of these YouTubes and there's a lot of those out there. Somebody so, asked if he was ever married. No, he was never married. There's a lot of um, uh, um, provocative thought about that subject, but we really don't know and he was he was very close mouthed about that aspect he did paint a lot of young women mm -hmm. um no, they were and beautiful their, paintings those yes yeah. and and i didn't show a lot of the the really you know the the high social pieces mm -hmm. that he did do um so you know basically he did have relationships with women though I don't know how close he was to any of them. That, that's, that's, throughout all of this, there is that question, how close was he to anybody? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so somebody said they appreciate your talk and I really like the part of you being, um, talking about um, a Sergeant and Hopper. So, yeah. you know, how you brought them right into the conversation. Right. And um, it was, but I'm still oh, thinking was, about that. It was profoundly influential. Yeah. I mean, uh, Homer's influence on American painting is very profound. I didn't even try and go into drawing the 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 branches that grew out of this tree because there's <laughs> there's so many artists that that were influenced by him and yeah, like and it. and his his use of watercolor, John Marin the modernists all looked at his work and, and looked at the spontaneity and the, the, the uh, fluidity of, of, his, of his watercolors and, and integrated that. Um, Your so. knowledge is just, just keeps on going, doesn't it? The way you ah. keep bringing in all these other things that um, <laughs> some those artists I ha we had really talked about. So that's, but you yeah. always, when you talked about, um, and I had that visual immediately. Uh, God, when you talk about the space and the one color. Yeah. About, uh, Parker, no, I can't think of his name, but okay. I love the way you bring on some of the artists that we had already had. And I like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fairfield so we, Porter. Fairfield, Fairfield Porter, Porter, that was it. Yeah. 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 And um, so it was great. Um, we know you're doing one in May, uh, but we haven't decided on the artist yet. So it'll be May 6th which is a Friday at two o'clock, but I think you haven't figured out which artist you're going to it, do. It's either going to be Bachman or Rothko, I believe. Okay. But, All right. but either way, it'll be good. 
Either way, come. <laughs> and yes. don't forget, yeah, yeah. forget to go to our website. Don't actually don't forget to go to the library. The library is opened. All the services are available. Um, Children's Room is having indoor programming. Adults are not having indoor programming, except for one program with a storyteller, Carol Birch. For those of you who have been in the uh, Chapel Call Library for many years will know that name. She's a, a famous storyteller, and she used to be a children's librarian at the Chapel Call Library. She'll be doing a story, uh, adult storytelling. But otherwise, come to the library. We're open, available, and we'd love to see you.